Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God. And let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for this day. It is a day that you have made and we rejoice in it. Lord, we thank you for this word that you give to us. The whole word from Genesis to Revelation. We are in the middle of Daniel. And we so appreciate what we have learned thus far. Keep teaching us, Father, and showing us what we need to see in it and how it might affect our lives today. And so we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. To Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. All right. We are doing Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We are not going to do many verses today in Daniel chapter 7. The reason for that is... Um, well, I was asking the Lord for insight into this passage. And did he download or what? <laughs> I was like going, okay, I can't do all of that in one week. Okay, so we're only going to do the first little section. I just want to show you some of the things that are there that maybe, maybe you already know about, but maybe, you know, time passes, we sleep, and we forget. And so we're just going to go ahead and... Maybe just review a lot of this. So, uh, what we're going to do today, instead of reading the whole chapter, which is like 999 words, we're just going to take it in sections. And we're doing the eight, first eight verses today. And so I'm going to be interrupting a lot as I go through, because there's a lot to do. The first three verses are these. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon... Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. All right, those are the first two verses. And there are three things I see in there, first of all, that we have to figure out and look at, clarify. The first part says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Well, didn't he die already? Yeah, you know, he's the mister riding on the wall and died that night, you know. So how is he in chapter 7? What's going on here? Well, here's the thing. The way Holy Spirit had this particular book put together, he had chapters 1 through 6 as a unit. And so you have you know, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and the different things that he did and then the writing on the wall and then Daniel in the lion's den and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All those things were at first. Now, starting with chapter 7, we get into the dreams and visions that Daniel had during the course of his time in Babylon. So God just put them together so that instead of interspersing them together and us maybe going, okay, now what's going on or have you, he just puts them all together for us. Uh, so that's what's happening. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had this dream. And he had a vision. And he wrote it down. And it's a very good thing that he did that. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So now we hear in this particular text that it's the four winds of heaven that are stirring up the great sea. Okay? So the origin of these winds that are stirring up the great sea is none other than God himself bringing these four winds of heaven. And basically, when, when you get the four winds of heaven speaking, if you're talking about winds from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and they are bringing up and churning up the sea. Okay. So it's not any force of man who is doing this. It's God stirring up the sea. The other thing that we need to understand is what the sea symbolizes here. 
what the sea symbolizes. You know, because a lot of times we think, well, the sea is the sea is the sea. No, in the scriptures, the sea can often mean people. All right? Let me just give you a couple of verses here. Isaiah 17, 12, and 13. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas. And the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters. So you see the sea is tantamount to many, many peoples, many, many nations. And then in the book of Revelation, we have a vision of the harlot. And in the interpretation of it, we read, this is the angel telling John what he's seeing here. He says to John, he says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So, in Isaiah, you have you know, people likened to many waters, many you know, waters being stirred up, and then also in Revelation. Now, of course, in Scripture, the sea can also be a sea. It doesn't have to be people. It's context. That makes it all clear. So we have to take all of these things in context and pull it all together. So now he's having a dream. He's seeing the winds of heaven stirring up the nations. So, so far, that's what we've got. And then he sees verse 3, And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. So four great beasts are coming up out of these peoples and nations and multitudes. So verse 4 says, the first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I contemplated the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. Okay, we kind of take that as a big unit because there's a lot to say. Well, who are the beasts? Later we're told in this chapter that they are kingdoms. Most Bible scholars and commentators consider these four beasts, these kingdoms, to be the same four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw with the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver and the you know belly of, of bronze and the legs and thighs of silver and no of iron and so forth. Um, I would, however, and I you know I don't necessarily disagree with that. Okay, it could be, certainly be the case. But I would like to con us to consider something that God may be telling us something new here. So that rather than take the old way, the, the general way of looking at this text, I'd like to, for us to consider that maybe Daniel was being shown something in the far distant future. He already saw the distant future from where he was, you know, those 400 years prior to Jesus' birth and all the kingdoms that came and went. He saw that. That was Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I'm not so sure that Daniel had to 
had that all reiterated to us since Nebuchadnezzar already saw that. He already interpreted that dream. I don't know that he had to have that. In chapter 8, we're going to have a little bit of reiteration. And so it's like, why is God reiterating all of this stuff? Why is he saying the same thing over and over again? Not that God can't do that. Sometimes we're just dense and he needs to do it. But if we look at the possibility that this could be something even further into the future, we may be on to something. Maybe. Uh, so just kind of hang in there with me because this is part of the download that I got. We know that <laughs> prophecy can be layered and it's cyclical, okay? So it can come around again. So what looks like has happened before does happen kind of, sort of, again later on down the road in the future. Um, so what I want to say here is Daniel saw four beasts. The first was like a lion. The second resembled a bear. The third was like a leopard. But the fourth, he doesn't tell us what it was like about anything. He says it was different from all the beasts that were before it. It was different then. It wasn't like a lion. It wasn't like a leopard. It wasn't like a bear. It wasn't like anything in particular. You know, any particular animal. It couldn't relate to any of those things. All he says is that we are told that it was dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. The remainder of what? It doesn't really say. I'm thinking the remainder of the beasts. The remainder of the kingdoms. Okay? I want to suggest further that this beast was different than all the rest and could not be, you know, you could not, he could not pinpoint a particular animal that it could look like because it was a composite of them all. Why would I say that? Um, I say that on these grounds. Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, this is what we read. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his head, heads were blasphemous names. So, so far the similarities we have to the beast in Daniel, in Daniel 7, the beast comes up out of the sea and the beast has ten horns. Okay? Then, verse 2 of chapter 13 of Revelation, and the beast which I saw, listen to this, and the beast which I saw, this is John, okay, this isn't Daniel, this is John, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. It's a composite figure. Interesting. So, it's a composite, and actually the three, king, the, the three features of this kingdom are given in reverse order. Daniel saw the lion, the bear, and the leopard. Now this one is a leopard, bear, lion. Well, that's kind of interesting. But it seems, to, could be, could be a composite. And so why Daniel couldn't figure out what it was like, is the reason for that is, is that He'd never seen any kind of a kingdom like this. So he couldn't put it into words. And Holy Spirit didn't give him those words. But he apparently has given them to John. Okay? Which makes it look like it's even further down the road, if that's the case, into the future. So, um, so here we have Daniel not being able to describe this kingdom because it didn't look like any other kind of kingdom that he'd ever seen. Uh, it was a kingdom unique to history. May I suggest, it's all food for thought, food for thought, think about this, that, that what Daniel saw was the one world government that is being planned for our day. It's not like any one particular nation or state, it's an amalgamation of many. Because one of the things that they want to do is erase our cultural 
uh, lines and our national lines make us all look the same, act the same, be the same. You know, that's what they're trying to implement. And so with all those kingdoms combined, they're no longer unique. So you couldn't say that's a lion. You couldn't say that's a bear. You couldn't say that's a leopard. Because it's all mixed up. I'm just thinking. So it's an interesting possibility that we look at Daniel 7 and keep exploring what Revelation 13 says. Um, the other thing that I want to tell you is back in the back, I've got a number of uh, documents, papers. Um, this one, this is the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, this is all part of the one world government stuff that they're wanting. Okay, that's what this is all about. And so you get a flavor of what they're trying to accomplish. This is their 2030 goals. All right, let me just give you number one. By 2030, eradicate extreme poverty for all people everywhere currently measured at, at people living at less than $1.25 a day. Imagine what would have to be done throughout the world in the next 15 years for that to happen. Eradicate poverty in 15 years. It's like, wow. Um, and then you just kind of go on and on and on about that, but it's like, wow. Then we have the World Bank Group. That's identification for development, making everyone count. Well, they want to give everybody an ID all the world over. And this article talks about, you know, biometric IDs, chips, and that sort of thing. So that you don't even have to carry cash with you because, you know, they'll know your bank account and everything else. You just walk into Walmart, get your stuff, take it to the whatever, take it to the checkout, and there you go. Because <laughs> they'll they'll, they will have access to your bank account. So it's like, there you are. And then here's one that says, in Sweden, in Sweden already, cash is becoming radioactive. It says on this one, says here that it is already being considered by some that if you have to pay in cash, something is wrong. So what Daniel saw, what John saw, what's interesting is all great lofty goals, but without God, none of this is going to be able to happen. And that's the deal, without God. What Daniel saw... If, if what he saw was that amalgamation, one world government kind of thing in the far, far distant future, which seems to be like 15 years from now, um, what he saw, let's read that again, what he saw was, he said, that fourth beast was dreadful, terrifying, extremely strong, it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder of the kingdoms. They're trying to get rid of all kind of national identity. Trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. It's a possibility that what Daniel was seeing was into the far distant future that's happening right now. Um... It's a lot to think about. And you know, one of the things that he also says that John saw in Revelation 13 was this. He said that, um, you know, this little horn that came up and knocked out three of the first horns, they were pulled up by the roots. This horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. Well, in Revelation 13:5. Uh, this beast that came out of the sea in Revelation, uh, the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because 
he gave his authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who's like the beast and who's able to wage war with him there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies again similarities here um, we just have to take this all into account you know these different things and, and just mull over them and consider where we may be one of the one of the commentators that I read well, his comment was this, it's very interesting, but he says, for all of the work that nations and governments and democracies and monarchies and whomever it may be, all the different types of government, try as they might, try as they might to put together a decent government for all people, or most people, try as they might the best they can come up with is something beastly. Because the governments of the world are not God. And if the governments of the world are not even attempting to seek God and what they're trying to do, then um, it's even going to be a bigger mess. Our job, of course, is to keep our eyes on God. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Staying aware of what's going on. And you know what? That's a hard job because there is so much information coming at us that it's really difficult to keep up. I mean, I was alerted to all these documents that you have because somebody sent me an email and said, check out this YouTube video. So I did and I you know, copied all the links and all that sort of stuff. But if we're not all working together and, and coming up with these things and, and downloading them and checking them out and sharing with others, then we're just going to be as ignorant as the masses. Well, now is not a time to be ignorant. It's a time to be informed of what's going on. And so I just wanted to you know, let you see some of, the, some of the similarities between what Daniel saw and what John saw and, and just let you start asking the question, hum, is it a possibility that Daniel was seeing now as opposed to before Christ? I really think it is because of the type of creature that John saw and what it looked like to him and Daniel was not able to describe it. So we keep moving forward with all of this information the good news is, though we are going to stop here, the good news is, is that in verse 9, thrones are set up, and the Ancient of Days takes his seat. And guess what? It is not going to bode well for this boastful kingdom. <laughs> it is not going to bode well for them. But... I didn't go on with that because I thought, oh man, that's a whole new section. And, but, but these are kind of background things to be thinking about this week as we get into uh, that particular section. But I also think that that section plays into the possibility that that is also the end times rather than before Jesus Christ. But we'll talk about that next week. But that's for today. Amen and amen to that.